I'm going to talk uh, in a little UFC way. I'll just start really for 15 minutes and then we can have more discussion. Uh, I'll talk about uh, the current race and really in a UFC way, uh, the, the mixture of ideas and politics. Uh, here at the UFC we're trained to think about ideas and the ideas do shape the election. But the more I study politics up close, the more I really do think uh, personality and character really matter the most. I have a friend who's now in the State Department who used to teach at Johns Hopkins. And whenever I get an academic who goes in the, into power, I, I always ask, you know, what have you learned actually being in government that you didn't know? And he said, I used to think politics was 75% personality and relationships. Now I think it's 95% personality and relationships. And there's a, a large degree of truth to that. And I've spent the last 20 years really studying politicians up close. Uh, and the first thing you notice about them is they're not like us. Um, the sort of normal conversations we would have around the Common Core is not something uh, they would have. They are well, almost without exceptional emotional freaks. Uh, they feel the need to dominate every room they enter. Uh, they, uh, some of them have a fear of being alone. They have what I call Lageria Dementia, which is talking so much they drive themselves insane. Um, they have, uh, they invade your personal space to, a, they, if you get around senators, they'll, they'll touch you and they'll put you know, their hands on your inner thighs thighs and they'll <laughs> caress you. I actually once saw, and this is a, a great senator who we should pay homage to, I once saw Ted Kennedy on the Senate floor with Dan Quayle. And they were actually good friends and they, they got together and they braced each other and they started talking and their faces were this far apart and their arms were going up and down their back and <laughs> as they were talking. I was up there in the Senate, in the press gallery, you know, thinking, get a room. Get, uh, As some of us who went to the UFC were not necessarily people, persons first, uh, <laughs> they really are. Uh, they also have extremely large heads. If you look at senators, as somebody once said, what they have is not a head, it's a container for a head. <laughs> They also tend to be, and to be fair to them, uh, they tend to be surprisingly earnest in private. We think of them as strategizing, politically cynical. I've met very few who are actually cynical, uh, who are leading politicians. Their lives are so miserable in many ways. The endless travel, the fundraising, the boring committee hearings, you actually wouldn't do it unless you thought you were serving the public good. And if you get them together, they're a very earnest group of people who will talk about some computer program that saved their state half a million dollars or, or did something. And so I, I think we journalists are more cynical than the politicians and then the voters are more cynical yet about, about uh, who they are. Uh, and then, but then they face challenges. They face these character challenges. The first is the intense partisanship in Washington. I was at the, something called the Civility Summit in Williamsburg, Virginia, where the Annenberg Foundation got Republicans and Democrats together to, to try to be civil to one another. Uh, and uh, I remember the Civility Summit because I got to watch 170 drunk members of Congress at karaoke night. Uh, <laughs> these phallic balloon hats. Uh, but the symptomatic moment was one afternoon walking down the hall at the Greenbrier Hotel, a woman's in the hallway in tears because she's been attacked so viciously in one of the breakout sessions. And this is the civility summit. Uh, I was at a seminar of a House Democrat. She has about 40 members of uh, Congress just to get together for a seminar discussion group. And one of them said to me, you know, I don't hate George Bush, but I regard him the way I would regard someone who molested my granddaughter. <laughs> okay, I'm not, if that's not hatred, I'm, I'm not riling you up. Um, and so, but when you get them together, they're trapped in this system. But when you get them individually, at a lunch or a dinner or just an interview, they, uh, they will admit the flaws in their own program, the strengths of the other side. They're sort of trapped by this stupid thing they're in the middle of. It is a system of polarization they feel trapped by and they hate it. Almost universally, they hate the way they're forced to behave. And so that leads you to believe that there actually could be some changes. Uh, there are other challenges they face getting reelected. I interviewed a, a woman named Deborah Price, who's a moderate Republican congresswoman from Columbus, Ohio. And I interviewed her recently, and she had just run a very vicious race, a very close race where vicious ads had been run against her, and she'd run pretty vicious ads against her opponent. And she told me one day my mother called me up and said, I'm ashamed of the ads you're running against your opponent. 
And that's tough coming from your mother. Uh, and she's, uh, since she's resigned, she's not gonna run for re-election again. But it was the horror of what she had to do to her opponent. When you're in a close race, you lose all control of your campaigns. You give your campaign over to the national consultants and they run your campaign. And those are when you get the really nasty races, really savaging other people. And so they're sort of trapped by the closeness and the, the political system they find themselves in. And this is the constant refrain. When you meet them, they're reasonable and private. Then you see them on TV and they're idiots. And, and this is, I think, one of the problems with our political culture. And so it's been interesting to me to watch the candidates uh, this campaign because I've, I'd interviewed them all several times. I interviewed Obama quite a lot before he became Messiah. Uh, and, it, and, it's, and it's been interesting to me to watch him. And when you, with my current job because of the power of the New York Times, uh, my joke is that being the conservative of the New York Times is like, like being the chief rabbi at Mecca. Uh, <laughs> With the times, you get you get this you get this access. Uh, my office mates uh, on one side of my office on one side is Maureen Dowd, and the other side is, is Tom Friedman, <laughs> what I call Ego Alley. <laughs> Actually, but Tom, I, I have deeply resent, resentments of Tom because, as you know, his book, The World is Flat, has sold more copies than there are human beings on Earth. Um, and he, he's actually, he lives about a quarter of a mile away from me, and his house, somewhat larger, uh, quite, about twice, three times the size. Uh, and we were driving by, and my 14-year-old son then 14 elbows me and points at Tom's house and says, same job, Dad. <laughs> Because of the times, we do get access. And so I've had the chance to interview uh, these people and get to know them, not in the way any normal friend would, but in the way a journalist and a politician can get to know each other. And it's a reminder of the importance of character. With President Bush, I've interviewed him in the Oval Office probably half a dozen times, 10 times. And the first thing to be said about him is that he's 60 IQ points smarter in those settings than he looks in, in, uh, in public. Now, for some of you, that'll say, okay, it brings him up to 80. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, if you, if you ask about Russia, he knows about Peter the Great. He, he, he's read books of Russian history. You can have a normal conversation with him. But the thing you get from him is the intense self-confidence. One interview I sat down. He said, David, I want you to know, and this was not long ago, I'm more convinced than ever that the decisions I made have been the right ones. <laughs> lobby has been heard from. Um, are any Protestants want to voice an opinion? Uh, <laughs> uh, but the thing uh, you, that strikes you is when he sees the future, when he sees the job of a leader, he really sees it 50 years in the future. Uh, and he sees the job of the leader is to think way out there. And so he really still, when he talks about the Middle East or this country, he's thinking way out there, next couple of weeks or months or years, not so interested. But that is, that is I take aside what you think of Bush and his policies, but that's an element of his, his mentality that would have import, been important for us to know in an election. And that's why I do think it's tremendously important to analyze. The other thing, which I think, again, this is not ideological. When you ask him about a policy he's been doing, say, uh, I was once in an interview with a colleague, a guy named Max Boot, who was writing for the LA Times. And Max is a military columnist. And he really lit into Bush on the troop levels in Iraq and the post-war planning. And Bush came back at him hard. And Bush's face turned red. And they really got in a screaming match. And But Bush kept saying, I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying this, a man who doesn't get to argue you in the culture of his White House. Uh, but, but, but we would ask, or Max would ask, uh, what about the troop levels? And he would say, well, I trusted General Casey. He's a good man. 
And so the, the attitude was, well, so-and-so is a good man, therefore he must have the right policies. And again, that's, that's an assumption that I think Bush was going to make, but it's something we should have known, that it, it's useful to know about. So when I look at the candidates now, I, I'm trying to pay close, close attention uh, to these sort of mental aspects of their lives. Now, with Barack Obama, as you know, when, when, he's, when he enters a room, and Hyde Parkers don't need to be told this, he, he's actually carried in by cherubs. <laughs> And uh, the heavens open up with the hallelujah chorus. Um, and I think what's striking, aside from the obvious things about him, is his incredible perceptiveness. And you talk to people who've taught with him here or who've worked with him uh, elsewhere, they all have stories about his ability to see what they were thinking and to understand what they were thinking. And my little story with Obama was, uh, uh, one day, a couple of years ago, I was writing columns attacking the Republican Congress for spending too much money, and I would throw in a few sentences attacking the Democrats to make myself feel good. Uh, and one morning, I got an email from Obama, and it said, David, you're only attacking the Democrats to make yourself feel good. Uh, and so he does have that ability, and he does have the ability, and this is down to impress those of us who affiliated with this institution. I, I once called him doing an interview and it was going nowhere, we're getting nothing. And he was cranky and tired and not being particularly nice to me. Uh, so I asked a question right out of blue. And it was late in the evening and he was walking off the Senate floor talking to me on his cell phone. And I said, hey, do you ever read Reinhold Niebuhr? 1950s theologian. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, what does Reinhold Niebuhr mean to you? And for the next 10 or 15 minutes, he did a complete version of Reinhold Niebuhr's thought, unbroken. And that's, that's actually quite impressive. Uh, and not only because it impresses the pseudo-intellectual, but, but be, <laughs> oh, that works, uh, but because Niebuhr had a view of history which really was built on paradoxes and ironies. The use of power, the need to use power, the awareness that you're corrupted by power. And, and so, you know, that is a skill that is rare in American politics. Now, if you want to talk about Obama's weaknesses, as most senators will tell you, Democrat and Republican, he's a mediocre senator at best. I, that's, to me, that's not necessarily a veto because being a senator is very different from being a, a president. Being an executive is very different from being a senator. But he didn't get that involved in legislation. And areas where he should have gotten involved, notably the immigration bill, uh, Ted Kennedy and uh, John McCain were hammering out the, really the nuts and bolts of the immigration bill. He would parachute in and try to reopen subjects they'd already settled. And, which, and then he showed up for the press conference. And so Republicans have a real disdain for him. They, frankly, McCain and, and most Republicans uh, have respect for Hillary Clinton, quite a fine senator. But they underestimate Obama because they thought he was a mediocre senator, he'll be a mediocre president. And I think when you talk to the Democratic senators, uh, they like him, but you really do not get rave reviews. So from the context of the Senate, and this worries me a little, because as much as I think of Obama and as much as I think we need a change and in many ways he embodies the change we need, there are actually a lot of people in Washington who really know how to do stuff. And I'm not sure he knows how to do stuff uh, and I'm a little worried they might outwit him. And I mean the Nancy Pelosi's, the Mitch McConnell's, they just are really good. And, and there's no evidence in, McCon in Obama's life that he knows how to translate the promise of change and knows actually how to do that day to day. And so that would be Obama's weaknesses. I'll, I'll, I think I'll skip Hillary Clinton uh, <laughs> starting today. Though I will say one thing about her again, very good senator, very smart. Character issue always with her was trust. One of her Democratic colleagues once said to me, you can always tell how Hillary Clinton will come out on an issue. You can never tell the thought process she, got, she used to get there. There's a wall there, you'll never get behind the wall. And I think that was a problem in the campaign. If you're unwilling to trust people, lay yourself out with people, uh, it's very hard to get them to trust you. Now finally, just to talk about John McCain, who I've, know, I've known the most, I uh, almost wrote a book about him. He is, first of all, the first thing to know is he's the most enjoyable guy in any room. There's a reason the media was thrilled to be hang around him, because he was just a barrel of laughs uh, to be around. He once took me to shoot craps at a casino. Um, <laughs> 
there are not many politicians who will do that. I, I said, you know, how's the Christian right gonna like this? You taking me to shoot craps? He said, oh, Bill Bennett shot craps. He was fine with it. Uh, and and it, it was, it was uh, we were going great. He told me where to put my chips on the table. We, I think I won $500 worth of chips, but because McCain is unable to sit still, uh, we got to the line, the cashier, where you check out, and he was unable to wait in line, because he just can't sit still. And so we left the casino, me with my little $500 worth of chips, so <laughs> I lost it all. But I think his most outstanding quality is moral sensibility. He is not a University of Chicago type of guy. He's not an ideological guy. I don't think he has a big moral philosophy of uh, the role of government, but he does have an acute moral sense. Uh, and it's not a, it's, it's interesting, it's not a Christian moral sense. It's a pre-Christian moral sense, and I don't say that simply because he's older. Uh, <laughs> Because it's a it's a classical a classical stoical morality based on honor, courage, and loyalty. And if something strikes him as wrong, uh, he will go after that thing. But oh, <laughs> I, I suspect somebody in the back leaned against a. Uh, unless it, it's my Betty Davis moment. <laughs> And so whether it's Jack Amerboff, Boeing, campaign finance, he is sort of a guarded missile. And to me, that's quite admirable. He will always pick on the dishonorable thing. Uh, that has made him not a great team player. Every Tuesdays, the Republicans have a lunch uh, where they set policy. It's called the policy lunch. They hand out a piece of paper called message of the week. And all the Republican senators are supposed to parrot the message of the week. McCain sits in the back of the room making fun of the speaker. He'll turn the message of the week, turn it into a paper airplane, <laughs> throw it up. Uh, when Santo Rick Santorum of Pennsylvania used to lead this, a particular target of McCain's, uh, you, you did a great job with that, Rick. Yeah, they we're really doing great as a party. It was all the cat calling from the back of the room. <laughs> and so that, on the one hand, is admirable because he is relentlessly honest. On the one hand, he resists organization. And I do, well, that would be my chief worry about him as president, is that the presidency is a team job, requires a lot of organization. Uh, he is incapable, as I said, of sitting still. He is an antibody of organization. That was true in the Navy, it was true in the Senate, and I think it would be true in the White House. It's certainly true in his campaign. He's the guy who takes off from the aircraft carrier and flies by night. Uh, and, and that would be a serious problem. Uh, for a McCain presidency. Now, so I, th I personally think I love these two guys, Obama and McCain. They're my two favorite politicians. And so to me, watching them fight is like a divorced kid watching his parents go at it, uh, <laughs> each other. Uh, and, uh, and what really bothers me is they really detest each other. Clinton and McCain really liked each other, respected each other, would have loved to have run against each other. McCain thinks Obama is a lightweight who hasn't done anything. Obama thinks McCain is a pompous hypocrite. And so I, d I wish we could have a great campaign over the next few months, but I really doubt it. <laughs> because that personal dislike just bubbles forth. Now, to me, the under you have two great men, I think, two very fine and very admirable men uh, who are running for president. But to me, and then I'll just finish with this, this is the determining factor of this election, which is the idea factor. We had, a, I think, a conservative era from 19, uh, 1980 to 2006, but it's over. Some of you may know the story, I've told this in public too many times, of me sitting in the, or actually me sitting in the Chicago Maroon office writing a parody of William F. Buckley's life and then him coming here and hiring me. Uh, I, I won't, I'll tell that story if requested, but it's, I've overdone it. But I went to work in National Review and really got to see the conservative movement at its height in the Reagan era. Now, it's, there are a lot less oddballs, but a lot more sleazeballs in the movement. It was very good in dealing with the problems of the 1980s, of communism, of crime, of economic stagnation. It is now intellectually moribund, has done very little work on problems like income inequality, middle class squeeze, rise of China and India, uh, domestic reform. It's really, it's really interesting to watch a movement that just runs out of steam. Liberalism, on the other hand, is, uh, has got a coherent body of work around, especially around subjects like income inequality and wage stagnation. <coughs> Groups of books, articles, scholars, all saying essentially the th same thing who Obama can draw from. And so you, you see the tides shifting. 
I frankly don't think we're going into a, a liberal era because though the Democratic Party has all the tides and the Republican Party is, is really collapsing, the Republican Party has aged 10 years in the past three. Uh, that's because they're losing pretty much everybody under 30. But intellectually, the country wants a change, but their suspicion of government is still as high as ever. Their suspicion of taxes is still as high as ever. So when the Democrats take office, they will find themselves with a country which is recalcitrant about a lot of their policy views. And they will also find themselves with a series of underlying issues which uh, they will be immobilized by and will have trouble dealing with. The most important is Iraq. Believe me, we're not getting out of Iraq in the next three or four years, no matter who's elected president. The second most important, or most important domestically is the budget squeeze. The, the amount of bills coming due right now is already being felt. The amount of money that you can tax or spend is really minimal. And so these will be severe governmental challenges. Nonetheless, let me finish there to get uh, your comments, discussions, and comments on Plato. But uh, if, if we are going to have a, a Hyde Parker, um, it's better him than most of the professors I actually had. <laughs> Thank you. Right, the qu the qu Colin quickly started with Lincoln and his intense struggles as a young man, really con nearly contemplating suicide, really going, I don't know, a severe depressive state, and how his awareness of his own flaws helped him through the rest of his career. And my point was, we tend to focus on the strengths of the candidate when we choose them, but you, it's really important to have a candidate aware of his own flaws. And so I, what I didn't write in that column, but I hope to provoke, was, well, of these two, who are aware and who is not aware? And I would say Obama is, for a guy who's gone through what he's gone through, he's acutely aware. He's, acute, he's one of the most self-aware people I've ever met. But he's acutely aware of what this process is doing to him, inevitably. Because, you know, you're worshipped and you're, you're, you just put up a shell. Uh, and I would say two things. One, very heartening, is that it's obvious, and he talks about this openly, he's bored by the adulation. Uh, and he's, it's obvious that he's bored on the campaign trail, frankly, in the way it was never obvious that Hillary Clinton was bored. She was into it every day, where he was like, oh, God, another worshipful 10,000 people. <laughs> uh, because at some level, he knows it's, you know, it's fake. He does the show. They love the show. He's glad they love the show. But it, it's just not new and interesting to him. And I, I sort of respect that self-awareness. I think the second and third thing to be says, one is incredible self-confidence and maybe disturbingly high self-confidence. Uh, and third, you know, and I think this is fundamentally the reason he hasn't connected with people without college degrees. And the, I was going to talk about the demography. The demography of this election is starker than any I've ever seen. And I think one of the reasons is, part is race, that's obvious, but part is they look at him and they see the struggles of their own lives and they think, what has that guy ever struggled? And they just don't see the resilience there. And so to me, that's an open question to whether he, he will have that sort of resilience. Now, McCain has, uh, has been through hell. And to, to me, this is his greatest strength that he had those years, he was humbled by them, he felt himself a failure in prison, he saw other people who were better prisoners, though they all, his POW mates travel with him, and they speak very highly of his time, but his personal sense is, I broke, I didn't actually do what these guys did. And I think that is a sincere sense that he has. And so we think of him as a war hero, he believe me, he does not think of himself that way. And to me, that's, that's always been a very positive side of his personality. He's also, it's interesting, he's not one of those guys who dwells on it a lot. I once went down to him to, with him to a movie set. They were making a movie of his life. We went down to the prison. They rebuilt the Hanoi Hilton, the exact replica. He walked in. The actors who were Vietnamese surrounded him. They were in prison guard uniforms, and they asked for his autograph. It was kind of a weird image. Um, and, 
he was with his friend Bud Day, who was a Medal of Honor winner and a real hero and who saved his life. Bud had to see the set and see everything, was really moved. And McCain was like, oh, that's interesting, let's go have dinner. Uh, and he's a guy who's moving forward. So I would say he has a deep moral sense of his own weakness, uh, but he, he lacks Obama's reflectiveness in general. Sir? Uh, what are your thoughts on potential running mates for the DD Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll come over there. Uh, my, uh, my, my quick thought is, uh, well, obviously Obama needs to pick an old white general. Uh, <laughs> So he, he should pick Dwight Eisenhower, and, and John McCain needs someone younger than himself, so he should pick Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, uh, that's my, that's my pre-Klan joke about that. Uh, my, my, my thoughts, first of all, I, I don't, don't believe that vice presidential candidates matter that much in the election. I, I, uh, since LBJ, I really don't think they've carried a state or done much, maybe helped the image for a few days. So I think you really focus on governing. What does Obama need as a governor, somebody who actually knows how to run legislation through Congress? What happened this week in Congress was tremendously important, the failure of the global warming bill. It didn't even come close to passing. You cover the campaign trail, everybody's oh, let's do something serious about global warming. You get to the Senate, it's not even close. So he actually needs a legislative engineer. To me, that would be a guy like Tom Daschle, who shares his temperament and personality, or Sam Nunn from Georgia, who might be a little, getting a little elderly. As for McCain, as I said, he resists organization, so he needs someone who cares about domestic policy and is super organized. And there's a guy named uh, Rob Portman from Ohio, who was the budget director and a congressman for 10 years. And then the other thing he needs, he needs a connection to the working class which has always been the heart and soul of the Republican Party. And the guy who I think is best at that is Governor of Minnesota, Tim Pawlenty, who's the intellectual author of something called Sam's Club Republicanism. Let's not be for the country club, let's be for Sam's Club. Republicans won uh, the white working class by 24 percentage points last election. If they lose those people, lose touch with those people, uh, they've, they're finished. Uh, and so he, he needs someone who really is a connected with that. One of the odd things about this election, we have two candidates, never have had two candidates, so removed from what you might call middle class suburban life. McCain's been part of the military aristocracy for generations. Obama's had this very unique life. But in terms of somebody who's lived in a suburban middle class home, gone to Applebee's and TGI Fridays, they don't have it. They don't have that, that instinct. And so uh, they both need some connection with that. Yes, sir. I was going to ask, uh, uh, race is going to be very important, I guess. Uh, Americans like to tell themselves the story that they are moving beyond race. And I, I wonder if it's your perception that we may be able to congratulate ourselves that Obama has become the nominee for president, but it will work, race will be the defining element that might defeat him as president. Yeah, this is uh, something we talk about a lot and there's no evidence. Because there are a few people who will say I'm voting on race, but relatively few. And so you're defining how much is race really a factor, you're guessing. And I will say among the pundit class, uh, I'd say 80% of the white pundits think that race is on balance a plus for Obama. I'd say 100% of the African American pundits think it's a negative. Uh, that it's, just, they think we're crazy. They think you do not understand America and what is about to happen to Obama. Uh, and I guess the two things I'd say are, one, he wouldn't be here if he was African American. So it got, it was a help to some extent. It's clearly a help with a lot of moderate Republicans who even after he won the nomination, you could see were thrilled by the prospect that an African American could get a nomination of a major party. It's clearly hurt him in Appalachia. If you take the, that swath of, of, uh, of America settled from New York State down through Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, down that swath, the, the, the margins were so lopsided against him that it just had to play a big role. I, it's hard to know on balance whether he's helped or hurt. My personal instinct is that he's helped, that people, he, he, he not only talks about change, he embodies change, and that's part of it. And so I think on balance, uh, he's helped by, by his, his race, but I could be wrong. Uh, let's go right here. 
Then I'll go back. All right. Um, can you talk a little about the candidates, kind of their breadth of interest? Obama wants to really focus on the economy and some domestic issues, McCain very much on national security. But what's your sense of kind of how beyond those areas are these are they really interested in kind of all the challenges facing America? Or do they really have those specific things that maybe will delegate the areas right. that they're not focused on? Yeah. I would say they the one thing they both care about passionately together is changing the political structure in Washington. <clears throat> they both care about that process issue. And I think that's important because underneath all the other issues that we've come up in the campaign, it's the crisis of authority that is really why the country is so disillusioned. A belief that our institutions really can't function, that they don't move, they can't do anything about anything, whether it's health care, and, and they're right to put that first. <clears throat> Both really care. As to what else they care about most passionately, it is simply true if you spend four hours with McCain, You'll spend an hour talking about Ted Williams, uh, an hour talking about history, some biography, a little time talking about short stories. He reads Flannery O'Connor, big short story guy. And then a lot of time talking about foreign policy. And you can mention any subject in the world. He's been there. He knows the leaders. But then when you talk about domestic policy, the, the glaze, the eyes glaze over. And that is just true of McCain. Obama, I think, is more universally conversant in all these subject areas. Uh, and so I guess Obama's interests are, are broader than McCain's. Uh, whether he, the fact is though, and this is the key of the being a, of the Senate experience. Being a senator, a very good senator, means having what Ted Kennedy has. If you ask Ted Kennedy about political philosophy, he's completely inarticulate. If you ask him about subsection C of some piece of legislation he passed 40, 14 years ago, he can tell you everything about that subsection. He's a detail guy. Who would have thought? But he really is. And I'm, it's, we've never seen Obama with that kind of detail on these subjects. But I'd say more broadly, he's conversant on all these subjects. But to me, again, it's changing the authority structure, changing the process of something can happen on all the other subjects that really matters most. Uh, I, I've had sort of called on somebody. Half, well, let's go to you, sir. Uh, yes, in the yellow. I think that uh, one of the most important things in determining uh, the success of the presidency is who he appoints to his cabinet and um, key staff positions. And I almost like to vote based upon that. But right. we get no information. What's your right. reading of uh, how they may um, go through the available people and the right. quality um, of the people they choose? Well, first I want them to pick good cabinet people. There's been a trend over the last few years which was totally went off the charts with the Bush administration of marginalizing the cabinet. Uh, because essentially a president cannot, cannot control a cabinet secretary. They can do whatever they want short of being fired. And so less and less power gets delegated to them. So if you're a cabinet secretary in the Bush administration, you're essentially taking orders from a 25-year-old White House mope in the, who live, works in the White House. And so with the exception of Rumsfeld uh, and Cheney and, well, who's not in the cabinet, but, and, but um, the secretaries of state, uh, very little power in the cabinet. And I just think it's tremendously important to put that power back in the cabinet so the president has something that looks like rivals, that looks like somebody who's equal. And that hasn't happened for a long time, frankly. It's so tempting to concentrate power and decision making in the White House among the people who worship you. And that's happened, I think, in every presidency since I've been covering politics. Now, as for the people around Obama and McCain, uh, the people around Obama are very impressive, I would say, as a whole. I would say his economics guy, who's here, Austin Goolsby, is very impressive. Uh, it was funny, you'd, you'd do these interviews, you'd call the Obama people and then call the Clinton people getting policy, and the, the Obama people were so nice. <laughs> and they talked to you and they were thrilled, you know, everything was happening. And the, the Clinton people were like, you are pathetic, you don't know how to cover this stuff, you're pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a real difference, <laughs> I noticed. And some of them have gotten, Austin Goolsby got into some trouble, a very impressive woman named Samantha Power got into some trouble because they were nice and normal people and they, they spoke their mind and they said the truth sometimes. I think they're being corrected of that. But, um, 
But I, and here's one thing, I was talking about this with somebody today. The question for Obama to me is, and I'm more moderate or center right, is how much is he a real reformer? How much is he, his policies are pretty traditionally Democrat. For somebody like me to be excited about him, I need to see some reform. And so, for example, on one subject like education, to me there's a sort of more or less education establishment. And then there are some reformers who are within the Democratic Party, like Joel Klein, who's in New York, or Michelle Rhee, who's chairman of schools. They are real reformers. And they do take on the unions when they need to. They're not hostile, but they take it on. Is Obama, which side is he on? And I would say, in general, the reformists feel he's drifting away from them. But they could, that could just be politics. But I would say, in general, his staff is very impressive. As for McCain, it, it would be a crisis for him if he won. Because the Republicans' intellectual or the cabinet-level type person are exhausted by eight years. And so then you look at McCain's mentality. If you ask him, and he's a very interesting guy, I mentioned he's not ideological, who are your two most, who are, which foreign policy thinkers are most important in your mind? And he'll say, well, I, I'll, I am really like Brent Scowcroft, and I really like Robert Kagan of the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, these two men agree on absolutely nothing. Uh, and I, I, think, I think he's aware of this, uh, and he just likes the interplay. But, but it's funny, half of him is sort of, sort of young and aggressive, and half on issue after issue is, is Council on Foreign Relations establishment. And he has both these sides, and that's been true of his campaign. Uh, I will say, I think his policy speeches have been very good, uh, McCain's. He reads them horribly, but, uh, but the substance <laughs> is pretty good. Uh, sir, over the, in the corner. Um, Tim Russell and many other of your colleagues in the press seem to have given Obama a free pass. Is it true, and why or why not? Uh, I, I, the question is whether we've given Obama a free pass. Uh, I, I sort of, <laughs> I, I think it's been like a 37 cent pass. Uh, I think there's been some criticism, but, but I don't dispute the fact that most of my colleagues uh, would like to see Obama elected president. I don't dispute the fact that most of my colleagues were not enamored of the Clinton campaign. And I do think he has gotten easier coverage than anybody else. Uh, now, now, when you talk about press bias, you always got to say a few things. One is a lot of us are opinion journalists, so we're paid to be biased. Uh, and then there are other people who are straight reporters, who are the serious ones. Uh, and, and they do have their personal beliefs. They also have a commitment to the craft of journalism. And especially in a campaign, they're pretty good, I think, at playing it straight. Does that mean their coverage is not informed by um, unconscious biases? No, it is sometimes. And I, you know, I used to work at Newsweek, and the, my friends there recently had a cover story. It was about the pristine Obama trying to run a fall campaign that was redolent of, or resonant of uh, sort of Socrates talking to Plato, or you know, and then these mean Republicans were going to uh, undermine all that with their nasty tactics. And that, that is a storyline you hear. Uh, but uh, the, the only other thing, I, so I do think there is a bias. But again, one, one final general point on, on press bias. I, a couple years ago, I went to a conference of sexologists at Michigan State University, a more boring group of people you never want to meet. But uh, one of the things I learned from them was that the media coverage of sex changed tremendously in the 60s and 70s, as you'd expect. But actual sexual behavior didn't change all that much. Actual sexual behavior changed after World War II and World War I. It was the actual experience of going to Paris uh, that changed things. And the, the, lesson, uh, the lesson of that is the media can do a lot, but that doesn't mean it has a huge influence on the way people vote. Because believe me, among my colleagues, there weren't a lot of Bush supporters, and the guy won two elections. So let's <laughs> Is that the Oiga Vault Caucus? Um, Man. Uh, Iran is being touted as the new foreign policy hotspot, and I was wondering if you could speak to the two different approaches that are taken by Obama and McCain and what your thoughts are on the like, merits. Yeah, the, the question was about Iran and the merits of the two approaches on that. Uh, 
in my view, equally bogus. Uh, I, I've, I spent two weeks interviewing policymakers, American and European, on Iranian issues, and then I listened to the campaign, and what struck me was how completely separated the two are. McCain and Obama are involved in this fight. Do we talk to Iran? Do we not talk to Iran? And that, they, uh, what, under what context? And believe me, if, if it's Obama, he's not going to go meet with Ahmadinejad anytime soon, no matter what he says at a debate. If it's McCain, if the opportunity to talk comes up, he will talk to them. So these two postures, this is a false polarization. The issue with Iran is, A, who actually runs Iran? And believe me, having had background conversations with a lot of policymakers, we have no clue. We know there are all these different factions. We have no idea how they're actually making decisions. There's a general sense that Iran itself doesn't know how, it, how, it, how it's run. That one policymaker likened it to uh, the Soviet Union in the 30s and 40s. Part of it was this ideological regime that wanted to spread this ideology around the world. Part of it was just a traditional great power. And it hadn't quite made up the mind whether it was a great power or an ideological cause. And that's somewhat where the Iranian regime is at right now. So they don't know. And you could talk to Iran all, all they want, but in, until they make up their mind, they're not going to fundamentally change. And then the final thing is, is when you talk to the policymakers, how much their hands are tied. Their idea is, we don't know what'll work. So we are willing to try anything. The Americans were not thrilled that Israel and, and the Syrians met in Turkey which was really all about Iran, but they said, let's try it, we'll try anything. And so when you talk to the policymakers, what you meet is their admissions that they're ignorant, their sense that they have no real leverage to stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, and the, their willingness to try absolutely anything. So you've got complete pragmatism at a very weak level. And then you go on the campaign trail and people are talking about one policy or another that is supposed to change things. And it's just, it's just not going to happen. I will say one final thing. When you go to the Middle East, and you, especially in the Arab world, they are so exercised about Iran. Uh, it's really striking to me the, in the Sunni nations in particular. And it's not the Iranian nuclear program, which they're, they don't really care about, but it is the Hezbollah, Hamas, the Hezbollahization of various militia groups in the region, which really threatens them. And you really do get the sense of a country on the march, a country that is gaining gaining strength week by week, and those of us who are in the moderate camp losing strength week by week. It really is tremendously startling to hear them talk about it. In the back, sir. Um, two questions, David. Um, one, do you see any strikes or similarities between like 52 and 56 where you have this U.S. senator from Illinois, this patrician, and like many people in the country saying, okay, he makes me look stupid. <laughs> yeah. Can we elect this person and with yeah. Obama making the president? Secondly, who's taller, you or Fred Barnes? Uh, <laughs> Fred is surprisingly tall. He's freakishly tall. He's like 5'10. <laughs> yeah. Shields and I are the same height. People, people, I, somebody said to me today, people always think I'm much taller because I'm sitting down. But, <laughs> Jewish guy went to UFC, what do you, what do you expect? Um, uh, did you have another question? <laughs> uh, the 5256. Now, since we're at Chicago, I assume you mean 52 and 56 AD. Uh, no, you're 1952. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I guess it, it goes to two things. One, the one thing, the one obvious difference is the Republican Party wasn't in complete, complete collapse in 52 and 56. They were the ones who hadn't been in power. Uh, but I think a lot of the, the parallels are a bit germane. Because the, I, I mentioned the demographics. In 26 out of 29 states, Obama lost the white working class, and not only by a little, by a huge chunk. And when you do a focus group, a great uh, pollster named Peter Hart did a focus group among Virginia independents uh, just a couple weeks ago. And these are people who hadn't voted in the primary. And the striking thing about them was they know very little about Obama. They know he's a Muslim who goes to church. Uh, no, they, 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 know, they, know, they know about Jeremiah Wright. But they really know very little about him. And Hart was saying, Obama needs to do what Reagan did in 1980, take out a five-minute bio ad and explain himself to all these people. He's gotten all this coverage, but a lot of people really have not clued in. But they do sense the coolness, 
the intellectualness and the, and the Hyde Parkness. And the, well, the Hyde Parkness is not only that the frame of reference is different, frankly, in this neighborhood than it is in Zanesville, Ohio, but they, a lot of people look at Obama's life, there's nothing they can directly relate to their own life. They don't know that much about McCain, but they know that he was in the military. They know people in the military. They basically can connect that immediately to something they know. With Obama's life, they really can't connect it. And so one of the striking things about Obama's campaign for all his enormous personal strengths, his party is running 15 to 20 points ahead of the Republican Party. He and McCain are tied neck and neck. Among independent voters, he used to have a 62-point favorability rating. He now has a 48-point favorability rating. He lost, I think, eight out of the last 14 primaries. He is not going into this moment strong. And I think it's all social identity. It's not the policy. Believe me, the American public support Democratic policies by 11 to 25 points. It's social identity. Who is this guy? Does he, does he, would he react to events the way I would? And that's a bit of the Adlai Stevenson issue. And when you see him, you think the Democratic Party has never really won with an academic liberal candidate. And they've tried, and then they tried more intelligent. Okay, you guys are going further back than I. Okay, that's a good point. That's a good point. Damn. Okay, I'm going to Northwestern where the people are. <laughs> Okay, with Wilson, but in the era since there has been a conservative movement, uh, but, you know, and, and they've won with Clintons, who were, believe me, Clinton was no liberal when he ran. Jimmy Carter was no liberal. Uh, and so if, they, if the party loses, it will be because they thought they were electing something new, but a lot of people thought they were electing the same old urban, liberal, intelligent guy. Uh, there was a breakout of funding for uh, Obama early on in the primary process. Has anyone ever done an analysis of who was funding Obama? Well, his funding is, in my view, it's more demographic than anything else. He, he had a huge number of donors. And well, I think with Obama, the, to be fair, I mean, I think 90% of his funding came from Resco, obviously. No, uh, no, I, no, I think to be fair, he, he, had, he, had, he has a very broad funding base. He's got a ton of money, but it is broad. And it is reflective of this new upper middle, highly educated upper middle class. And so I, I don't think it's, there's anything nefarious about his funding. It's reflective of the fact that we now have a lot of highly affluent people with college degrees who he speaks to very directly. And we've seen it in elections past. John Kerry's, the, the biggest donor group for John Kerry was employee, employees of the University of California. The second biggest was employees of Harvard University. So there are a lot of law firms, investment banks, but actually academics and administrators give a lot of money to campaigns these days. And so I assume they've been the base of the Obama campaign. And the Republican Party has lost contact with Winnetka, Illinois, with the main line outside of Philadelphia, with where I live, Montgomery County, which is another upper middle class area outside of Washington, Silicon Valley, all these places that used to be Republican areas. That's now Democratic. And I, I mean, I wrote a book about their kitchens. Uh, and and they, the, that's Obama's funding core. So I, I do think it's pretty broad. If, if Obama doesn't pull out of Iraq, how do you think he would uh, justify that to the country and what kind of support would he really believes he can pay for all the spending programs he has? Uh, well, that's a good question. He can't. Uh, but he, 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 the reason I don't think he'll pull out of Iraq is, one, the colonels in Iraq would be go crazy. They think we're now doing okay, and we, they'd be upset, and they have some, a certain number would go public. Two, every leader in the region would go crazy. Three, the Republicans would be outraged, and any hint of bipartisanship would be gone. So he'll do what he sort of hinted he'll do. He sometimes he said he'll pull out in 16 months, but most of the time he said we're going to get out as carefully as as we went in carelessly. I've forgotten the exact phrase, and that gives him an opening to draw down slowly over a period of four or five years or whatever. 
Uh, and that, uh, I, th I think, is the wise thing to do. But a lot of his spending programs are paid for, as you suggested, by spending zero in Iraq. And there just will be no money for that. That's why I talked a little about the financial constraints he'll face. Uh, and those financial constraints, you can talk to the director of the Congressional Budget Office, they're already severe. And if the economy continues to do what it's going to be doing, they'll be quite severe. And so it's not as if there'll be a lot of money. And, he, and his first priority will be health care, which will be quite expensive. And that'll take whatever money I think there is from the tax hike on the affluent. So I, I don't think there'll be much money for anything else, uh, part, for partly that reason. Ma'am in the aisle, did you have a question? Yes. Back to the press, uh, was the press anti-Hillary or pro-Obama? Uh, they press, again, it's a false generalization. Uh, but I would say, if I had to take the temperature of my colleagues, yeah. and I'm not talking about the time, I'm talking about the whole mass of idiots. Uh, it's, uh, I'd say both. And, and you have to understand what, most people are guided by things that actually impact their daily lives more than ideology. Most reporters are, are come from elite universities, they reflect the political breakdown of those universities. I think a study said 92% voted for Kerry last time, which doesn't mean they're hardcore liberals, but they're more that than, than Republicans. But they also like to be treated with respect and, uh, and, and well, they like to be treated with respect. And as I mentioned, press relations between the Clinton campaign were horrible. They were constantly screaming at you and spinning you and insulting your intelligence. The Obama people were not open. Obama's not an open candidate. It's not transparent. Spends very little time with the press, but the people are nice. Uh, and you get the sense there's some genuineness there. McCain is incredibly open. He'll still spend four or five hours a day with the press, just in conversation. Uh, so, but, so there was, there was some, uh, there were opinions, but again, I don't think that determined the election, the primary election. Uh, sir, in the middle. Why would McCain challenge Obama to a debate? Uh, a series of debates? Right. Well, there are, two, there are a couple of reasons why McCain would challenge Obama to a series of debates. The first and most important in McCain's mind is he does town meetings. That's all he does, basically. When he comes out, he does a very short speech, which he's not good at. Then he does a town meeting. And in the town meeting, if somebody gets up and disagrees with him, he hands the microphone back to that person, and they'll go back and forth four times, four or five times, arguing. And he likes doing that, and it's actually one of the more effective things he does, until he calls him a little jerk and tells him to go away. No. <laughs> uh, and, but it, he's good at that. He's quite poor at giving a set speech. The Obama... Uh, method, of course, is to do the big rally, generally, very, have very little question and answer. So the McCain analysis is, I just do this better, so we want him in my format. Uh, and I think they're somewhat right about that. I think they, as someone who's interviewed Obama several times, I think they underestimate how good he is. Uh, I, I interviewed him a couple weeks ago about Iran. And I, I was asking a very series of subtle questions designed to elucidate a grand philosophical principle. <laughs> and, and after three questions, he said, let me tell you what you're really getting at. <laughs> that, that literally happened. <laughs> and so he's, he's not a law professor for nothing. But on the other hand, and this is a weakness of mine, it could be the, exactly the skills I like that a lot of people don't like. Uh, that he's a law professor, I think that's great. A lot of people think he's a law professor, that's horrible. Uh, and a lot of them are law students who think that. Um, <laughs> but the, the, other, the other thing to be said is, McCain had a pretty good fundraising week uh, month, but uh, he has no, nothing compared to Obama's money. And so the idea that the campaign would be dictated by free media is exactly what McCain needs. That's the other issue. Sir? Um, what was your intellectual experience in Chicago? What, what, what books changed you? What were your uh, well, teachers? Thank you for being interested. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I was, um, I grew up in Greenwich Village in a somewhat left-wing household. My parents were professors, part of the think Yiddish, act British tradition. <laughs> Actually, uh, 
went to Grace Church School, and if you anybody know, right next to the Strand Bookstore, I was part of the All Jewish Boys Davening Choir. <laughs> And the one story I tell about my childhood when I was five, my parents who were more left than right by a little, uh, <laughs> took me to a bee in in Central Park where hippies would go just to be. And as part of their being, they set a garbage can on fire and threw their wallets into it <laughs> to demonstrate how little they cared about money. And I was five, and I, I saw a $5 bill in the burning garbage can. And I reached in and grabbed the $5 bill and <laughs> ran away. And that was my first step over to the, to the right. <laughs> The, uh, I, I, so I was a pretty traditional uh, liberal and called myself a democratic socialist. And actually, while I was on campus, I debated Milton Friedman for a TV show where I was the student he argued with. Uh, and I was the socialist, and he would destroy my arguments in about six or seven words. And then the argument, the camera would sort of linger on my face with my mouth hanging. <laughs> But I was assigned, and to me, in, in college, the Common Core was the, by far the best thing I did. Easily the best thing. And I was assigned a book uh, in political order and change, and I think we have a classmate here. I was assigned a book by Edmund Burke, Reflections on the Revolution of France. And I hated that book. <laughs> I, it moved me I, to rage, and I actually have my copy, and I was looking at it a few months ago for something else, and I see my idiotic little scribblings about what an idiot Edmund Burke is. <laughs> but over time, that book actually really started a turnaround for me. And every time I've deviated from Burke, I've been wrong. <laughs> uh, supporting the Iraq War was a deviation from Edmund Burke. And it was that common core experience uh, which was tremendously important. I, unfortunately, being a smart ass, thought I should take graduate courses in my third and fourth year, and I'd forgotten everything about them. I learned a lot of historiography, but no history. Um, but the Common Core was tremendously important. Western Civ was tremendously important. Thucydides, tremendously important. Uh, and then finally, one professor leaps out who was my thesis advisor, a guy named Neil Harris, who I think recently retired. <laughs> a, very, a very good history professor and really helped me out with a model of how to think about history and how to think about American history. There are a few others. It's funny, I'm sure we all have this. Again, because I was history, Arthur Mann was a very good professor. I had a, a, a writing teacher, Richard Stern, who's still here, who was a very good writing teacher. He thought, I remember when the first day of class, he thought it was a, a fiction and poetry class. So he made us submit. Um, a short story and a, and a poem to get in. And I wrote a poem, and then I wrote at the bottom, I make no claims on poetry. And he wrote when he handed it back to me, and it makes no claims on you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we, it's funny to think we should all spend a little time thinking of the few personalities that really rise out. And it's a lesson for education that you don't really remember the content of what you're taught, but you remember the teacher. Uh, sir. Can you talk to Senator McCain or Senator Obama about what type of Supreme Court justices uh, in the question? Yeah, I confess that's, it's not a subject I write a lot, a lot. I don't know it very well, so I've, I haven't asked them about that subject. I think if you're, uh, I think Supreme Court Justice Hillary Clinton would be a shoe in but no, I, I, I confess it's just not a subject I know about. Uh, sir in the green? Oh, ma'am? Um, I volunteered in Obama's uh, Texas organization, and I was greatly impressed by his organization. It seems to me to be far superior to anything I've seen in any other political campaign in many years. Do you feel that that will help him in the right. coming election? The question is whether his extremely well-organized campaign will help him as president. And it was a really well-organized campaign. And a couple of journalists and I sat down with Mark Penn, who was Hillary Clinton's campaign manager, just trying to ask him, you know, why didn't you read the rules that caucuses actually matter? You get elected from delegates. <laughs> caucuses actually matter. Shouldn't you care about them? And you just couldn't get paid. There was no answer to that question. And meanwhile, Obama, I think because he's a political organizer, I think because of David Axelrod, uh, he really had a superbly organized campaign. It helps when people really, well, people really cared about Hillary Clinton, to be fair. Her people really cared about her and were super committed. But they were just, Obama people were just better. Now, I think it's a good sign, but not a great sign. Uh, and I say that because I covered the George W. Bush campaign. And that was a great campaign, a beautifully organized campaign. I would say the George Bush 
2000 campaign, both thematically and structurally, was the best campaign I've ever covered at any level. Really a masterpiece. And the difference between campaigning and governing is that campaigning is one thing day after day after day. It's the same basic thing. When you look at a president's schedule, they spend 15 minutes with the CIA director talking about some live threat that's out there. Then they come out and they get photographed with the Olympic soccer team. <laughs> then they go to talk about health care. And it's, it's 15 minute blocks of totally disparate subjects. And it's a totally different environment. And so it's a good sign, but it's not determinative, I don't think. Sir, in the way. I don't know how much. Where's our minder? Yeah, sir. In the, uh, a couple of years ago, I was about uh, the Republican Party and sort of how it uh, was in the magazine. And then you wrote, uh, sort of how it's fall from grace, I guess. And then you wrote recently about the, uh, the Tories in Britain and how they're sort of 10 years of solitude and what they've done. I mean, what is your take on what the Republicans can do to sort of come back from, I guess, the end of their you know, 1980 and 2006 right. era? What can they do to maybe, maybe not rise again at the same peak, but not be so? Right. Well, I think the first, <laughs> yeah. that's a great bumper sticker. <laughs> Less screwed than before. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I guess my, my view is that what they need to do, the, the Goldwater-Reagan belief system was right for that era. But that era is over. And it was a little too libertarian, I think, for where the country is. And that there's a neglected tradition in American politics that begins with Alexander Hamilton, goes through the Whig Party, Lincoln, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, and then sort of dies. And this is a tradition that believes in activist government to help people compete. Not a, not a big government to shield people from competition, but an activist government to help people compete. In the 19th century, the examples of that were in the Lincoln's era, the Land Grant College Act, the Railroad Legislation, the Homestead Act, all of which created the means for people to be competitive entrepreneurs. But using government, and Hamilton used government to do that, to arouse the energies. So to me, for, for the Republican Party, one issue, and this is a pet peeve of mine, is that it seems to me the natural debate in, on economics, say, in this, in this country, is between people like Andy Stern, uh, the union organizer, who think that basically the problem of the economy is the globalization, is cutting wages, uh, and that we have big structural problems on the labor markets, we need much more unionization, we need to control globalization, uh, and we need really major, major market reform. That's one side of the argument. It seems to me the other side of the argument, which should be the Republican side, is that the global economy is basically functioning, that our problem is not fundamentally globalization, it's the movement to a skills economy and the need for education, and therefore we should start and end our economic discussion with human capital policies, with giving people the economic capital they need so they can do well in an economy like this one. And these are the two basic themes. One is, even if, one says, even if you get education, you're not gonna do well in this economy because of the way globalization is working. The other says, if you get education, you will do well. This is a natural debate. Right now, the Democratic Party has both sides of this debate. <laughs> and the Republican Party has, oh, it's not a problem. And, uh, or else we'll cut your taxes. That's how we'll ease your burden. And to me, those are not serious. And so to me, I, I wish the Republicans would seize this and push the anti-globalization people off on, on one side. And so to me, that I'll, I'll just tell one, my one favorite story. This is a book I'm working on, but I'll, I'll tell it just about the importance of, of human capital policies. This was research done by a guy named Walter Michel uh, at Berkeley and now Columbia. And it's very, one of the most famous pieces of social science research. We took four-year-olds in a room, put a marshmallow on the table in front of them and says, you can eat this marshmallow now, but I'll come back in 10 minutes. If you haven't eaten the marshmallow, I'll give you two marshmallows. Mm -hmm. And what you learn is that there's not a four-year-old on earth who can wait 10 minutes. They all eat the marshmallow. <laughs> in fact, he showed me the videos of kids trying not to eat the marshmallows. And some of, them, some of the kids, I saw one girl, she's literally banging her head on the table. <laughs> And th there's one kid who, uh, he's using an Oreo cookie, he picks up the Oreo, eats out the middle, carefully puts it back, <laughs> trying to get away with it. Um, that kid is now a US senator. Uh, but, but, 
the important thing is that the kids who could wait seven or eight minutes uh, 20 years later had much higher, much higher college completion rates and 30 years later much higher incomes. The kids who could wait less than one minute had much higher drug and alcohol problems, much higher incarceration rates. And basically it's a question of did the kids even at age four, have they developed internal strategies to control their impulses? And if you've done that, school will be okay. If you haven't, your odds, the odds are stacked against you. And so it's that sort of thing, getting beneath IQ and all that, really helps some people succeed and others not. And to me, any party should be talking about this. Uh, and to me, that's the, natural, that's the natural drive for a party that does believe in competition. You gotta give people the tools so they can compete. When you got 20 and 30%, or in this city, I think 44% of kids dropping out of high school, they're betraying all the incentives in front of them. You gotta help them get there or else they won't have any faith in a free market system. So that's my... Two last questions. Two, two last questions, ma'am. Over here. Chris, do you think it's gonna make any difference who's in the band and who the shuttle Who the spouses are? Uh, hmm, that's an interesting question. I hadn't thought about that. Um, the question was, do I think it'll make a difference who Michelle Obama is and who Cindy McCain is? I guess my instinct so far, people like both of them, I think people are especially uh, impressed by Michelle Obama, but I fundamentally think they're, you know, as I mentioned, mo the voters who actually decide this election don't pay all that much attention, and they barely know Obama and McCain. Uh, and so, uh, and I don't say that to d denigrate them, I think people are reasonably good at judging character. And so I, I do think it'll get down to the one person. I don't, I don't think Nancy Reagan helped to her, and she was a pretty strong personality. Rosalind Carter, uh, even Hillary Clinton, who was very strong, I don't think that really made a difference one way or the other. Okay, one more question in the yellow, sir. How will uh, the ability of either candidate, presidential candidate, to work with Congress, will it be affected by Congress, and how do you project success or failure? Yeah, I think it's going to be a, a real, as I mentioned, a real challenge. Both our previous presidents failed at it. Bill Clinton, when he would call, he would get on the phone with Congress people and he'd call them all, he'd call 16 in a row, and his problem was that on call 16, his position was 180 degrees from what it had been on <laughs> call one. And George Bush's problem, he doesn't make call one. <laughs> Dennis Hastert, who was here, or Bill Frist, who was majority leader, they barely had contact with Bush. They were, the, they were his party's leaders. In, and you'd ask Frist, well, what have, you, have you talked to Bush? And he said, well, I sit in meetings where he's there. And there's just a lack of com conversation. And so it's just really hard. And that's why I do think they both need someone. McCain obviously knows the Senate very well. <clears throat> but it will take, it will really take, when you, when you go back and read about Lyndon Johnson for all his flaws, when you read, frankly, about Richard Darman, who worked in the uh, first Bush administration, they would tell you, or not Johnson, but Darman would tell you stories about how you actually do it, how you lock people in a room and force them to compromise, how you, when you feed them bourbon, when you do this, when you do that. It's actually a skill. It's knowing when to spend time with them, when not to spend time, when to hold a press conference to lock them in, when not to. I rarely see legislators now, let alone Obama, uh, a little less so McCain, who actually know how to do that. And uh, I don't, not to be morbid, but one of the, there are many tragic aspects of Ted Kennedy's illness, but I, would, you know, I think a lot of people were counting on Kennedy to be that person for, for Obama since he is the best senator. Uh, and it, it, it's gonna be phenomenally tough. Again, underlying the challenge, this global warming bill last week, which just got nibbled to death. And Will, Woodrow Wilson had a great line in congressional government. He said, Congress is a pedantocracy. They take every big subject and make it pedantic. And that's very, very hard to beat. And so I'm, I'm quite worried about for both of them. Anyway, thank you for your...